Welcome to this mini lecture on muscle metabolism. Muscle contraction and the pumping of calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum uses a lot of ATP. Therefore, one of the major themes in muscle metabolism, and the one we'll be focusing on here, is how muscles constantly uh, can resynthesize large amounts of ATP from the ADP and phosphate. The most rapid method of ATP resynthesis is catalyzed by creatine kinase, the enzyme that transfers the phosphate from creatine phosphate onto ADP to make ATP. There's enough creatine kinase in most muscle cells to last for maybe about 20 seconds. The second most rapid process is anaerobic glycolysis. Here's the process of anaerobic glycolysis redrawn from your metabolic map. The glucose can either come in through a glucose transporter like GLUT1 or GLUT4 or come from the breakdown of glycogen. Remember that glycogen is broken down by glycogen phosphorylase which activates a phosphate giving glucose that is already phosphorylated and the glucose 1-phosphate can be interconverted to glucose 6-phosphate. When we start with glucose, then hexokinase adds the first phosphate. In either case, we end up with glucose 6-phosphate, which then gets isomerized, and then a second kinase adds another phosphate group to give doubly phosphorylated fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which aldolase then cleaves into two 3-carbon intermediates, which can be interconverted, so the dihydroxyacetone phosphate can be converted to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is what continues down into glycolysis. The next step is catalyzed by a dehydrogenase because it it oxidizes this intermediate and produces an NADH. And that becomes very important for the final step of anaerobic glycolysis. Then we produce our first two ATP, because remember we start, we have two molecules of this intermediate, so we make two ATP. Then there's a mutase and a um, a reaction that removes water, dehydration reaction, and then the final production of two more ATP uh, from two molecules of phosphorylated pyruvate. Now that pyruvate, if we're in anaerobic glycolysis, gets shuttled to lactate because the NADH that was produced up here has got to be reoxidized so that NADH pushes the lactate dehydrogenase reaction towards lactate and NAD+, and the lactate can leave the cell along with a proton. That lactate is then used by many other cells in the body, including the liver, for gluconeogenesis to resynthesize glucose for more muscles, etc. to use. Practice question. What mechanisms rapidly activate glycolysis in contracting muscles? There's probably many answers to this, but a clue to the, uh, the mechanisms I'm thinking about right now are shown here. Recall that calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, during the process of muscle contraction. Well, it also activates anaerobic glycolysis. Additionally, when lots of ATP is utilized and converted to ADP, adenylate kinase is always interconverting to ADP to 1-AMP and giving us more ATP. One mechanism is that both calcium and activated AMP-activated protein kinase catalyze the fusion of vesicles containing GLUT4 to the plasma membrane, allowing more glucose to enter the muscle cells. Additionally, glycogen phosphorylase is also activated by both increased calcium and increased AMP inside muscle cells. And lastly, calcium and AMP are both allosteric activators of the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. They can uh, greatly increase by up to about a thousand fold the activity of this enzyme and really increase flux through glycolysis. The third major mechanism that really sustains muscle contraction over the long run is aerobic metabolism. This image from your metabolic map shows the major steps in aerobic metabolism that are important for muscles. So recall that we can aerobically fully oxidize glucose, shown here, glucose in the pyruvate that was made from glycolysis, as well as fatty acids. 
Okay, so let's start with fatty acids. Remember that fatty acids to be oxidized first must enter the, mito the mitochondrial matrix, and they do so through a carnitine shuttle. So the uh, coenzyme A is transferred off and carnitine is transferred on. Once we have a fatty acyl carnitine, it can go through the translocase and CO, uh, the carnitine is transferred back off by CPT2 and CoA is put back on. That whole process gave us fatty acyl CoA inside the mitochondrial matrix, which then can be oxidized. And the process of oxidation, we call beta oxidation, produces an FADH2 in the first step, and then in the third step we have an NADH produced, and in the fourth step we have a cleavage off of an acetyl-CoA, so the two-carbon acetyl group attached to a coenzyme A, and then the fatty acyl-CoA that's two carbons shorter, and it can redo this whole process and be further oxidized until we have all acetyl-CoA and loss of NADH and loss of FADH2. So if we move over now to the pyruvate that we got from glycolysis, it is, trans it is uh, converted to acetyl-CoA in a very simple process, catalyzed by pyruvate dehydrogenase. We produce an NADH and a CO2 here to get an acetyl-CoA. So whether we got acetyl-CoA from pyruvate uh, or from fatty acid oxidation, it's now the exact same acetyl-CoA, which gets fully oxidized in the TCA cycle. Recall that the two-carbon acetyl unit is first trans transferred to the four-carbon oxaloacetate to make citrate, which gets rearranged to cisaconitate and isocitrate, which then gets oxidatively decarboxylated, so a CO2 is released, and an NADH is made. The next step is another oxidative decarboxylation, another CO2, and another NADH. Now we have made most of the CO2s that we're all constantly exhaling here in the TCA cycle and and up here by pyruvate um, oxidative decarboxylation. So the next steps in the TCA cycle involve more uh, oxidation, producing an FADH2, and another oxidation up here, making another NADH, and we're back to oxaloacetate. And now we're ready for the electron transport chain. So all of the NADH that we made here and here and in the TCA cycle gets reoxidized by complex 1, and the FADH2 gets reoxidized by complex 2. That Those reoxidation steps release electrons, and this process is an energy um, producing process that allows that energy to be converted to the pumping of protons into the inner membrane space. So we now have a proton gradient. And these electrons keep getting transferred down the line until eventually they're transferred to oxygen, the ultimate oxidizing agent. The oxygen gets reduced to water in the process. And this great proton gradient that was created is used to drive the synthesis of ATP by ATP synthase. This graph gives a summary of how ATP is made during exercise in different time periods. So we start with the previously made ATP. There's a couple of seconds of ATP that's already around for muscle contraction. Creatine phosphate gives us up to another about 20 seconds of ATP before anaerobic metabolism, shown in this magenta color, kicks in. And um, finally, aerobic metabolism gets going after uh, increased oxygen delivery to cells. Uh, and the sustained exercise absolutely requires aerobic metabolism. Recall that the ratio of carbon dioxide produced to oxygen used, the VCO2 divided by VO2, or the respiratory quotient, RQ, indicates the primary macronutrient being oxidized. We talked about this uh, way back many weeks ago in Foundations of Medicine. So practice question. Oxidation of which of the following causes the higher RQ, fatty acids or glucose? Recall that glucose 
like all other carbohydrates, is already partially oxidized. There's a oxygen bound to each carbon. Whereas for fatty acids, the carbons are largely completely reduced. That gives fatty acids more energy per gram, more kilocalories per gram, because um, fully reduced carbons uh, release more energy when they're oxidized compared to partially oxidized carbons. Now, the opposite is true for the respiratory quotient. So, for example, a carbohydrate, C6 carbohydrate, uh, reacts with six oxygens to give six waters and six CO2s when it's fully oxidized. And the, therefore, the respiratory quotient is six divided by six, or one. We compare that to a fatty acid, like the saturated fat palmitate that has 16 carbons. It requires 24 oxygens to fully oxidize it uh, and uh, to give 16 CO2s, and therefore has a respiratory quotient of 0 0.7. Muscles are made of different fiber types that have different metabolic preferences. The image shows a cross-section of a muscle that has been stained for mitochondria. The darker the stain, the more mitochondria there is. And you can see there's labeling in terms of the slow oxidative type, or type 1, the fast glycolytic type, or type 2b, and the intermediate type, called the fast oxidative, or type 2a. Practice question. Can you predict the metabolic differences between the different fiber types? So try to go through this chart and uh, see if you can figure out which type is likely to have the higher glycogen content, myoglobin content, lipoprotein lipase activity that's in the lumen of capillaries surrounding these fiber types, and resistance to fatigue. Here are the answers. So the fast glycolytic types need the highest glycogen content. They use less myoglobin because myoglobin is used to transfer oxygen from hemoglobin to the mitochondria in muscle cells. And the fast glycolytic type muscles have fewer mitochondria. See here, you can see there's not a lot of mitochondria there, and therefore require less myoglobin. They also have little lipoprotein lipase activity. Recall that this enzyme is in the capillaries surrounding the muscle fibers, and it releases fatty acids from lipoproteins such as chylomicrons and very low-density lipoproteins. And since fatty acids have to be oxidized in mitochondria, which the fast glycolytic fiber types have few of, they have little use for lipoprotein lipase, whereas this enzyme is high in the capillaries of the type 1 or the slow oxidative fibers. The fast glycolytic fibers are also have, um, oh, this is backwards, a low resistance to fatigue. They fatigue quickly. And whereas the slow oxidative fibers have a high resistance. Sorry about that mistake. And finally, our summary. So muscle contraction requires lots of ATP that can be made most rapidly from the creatine kinase, creatine phosphate system. Anaerobic glycolysis is also rapid, and it produces lactic acid, which is largely converted by the liver back to glucose by gluconeogenesis. And for sustained activity, we need aerobic oxidation of both glucose and fatty acids. Carbohydrate oxidation produces fewer ATP, meaning there are fewer calories per gram, but has a higher respiratory quotient compared to fat oxidation. And finally, different muscle fiber types express different genes to allow them to specialize in fast glycolytic versus slow oxidative metabolism.